Okay, so uh, good morning to Metrics. Good evening to um, those of us who stay in Europe. Um, and the gist, so I will start with the gist of the paper. The gist of the paper is that the, the precision that we see sometimes in uh, primary studies can sometimes be higher than the true precision. So can, can sometimes be spurious. Um, and I need your help today, and I would appreciate it. Um, to help me if we should keep the title general as it is, or if we should uh, kind of refocus it on observational research, because we think the, the problem is potentially quite broad, but you will have much more experience, especially with experiments, because we, in economics, uh, it's, it's really hard to do RCTs with the entire economy. So we mostly do regressions with observational data, and in observation research, we believe the problem is potentially quite strong. So there, we are quite confident. Anyway, um, the paper is joint work with Zuzana, who is originally from Slovakia, also with Pedro from Portugal, and Heiko from, from Germany. Uh, I'm Czech and now mostly based in Prague. So let's start. What we do in the paper, as I already uh, said, we um, show that it's possible and indeed uh, plausible uh, that sometimes the precision that we see reported in papers can be artificially high, it's curious. And then we have troubles in meta-analysis because most meta-analysis techniques use um, precision as a weight or some sort of inverse variance weights. And we propose a solution which we call MAVE, meta-analysis instrumental variable estimator. And the essence, I will of course explain the details, but the essence of MAVE is that we, instead of the reported precision, we use the portion of precision which can be explained by sample size in the meta-analysis, in the metadata set. Um, we have a website where you can find, of course, the paper in, in its full long version, but we also have a short block version and we have codes for, for MATLAB and R, and also our, our R package, which you can use to, um, to actually employ the estimator. And let's start with an example of what spurious precision can be or how it can show how it can manifest. Um, and to, um, to, sh to show the, or to, the first example uses one of the rare experiments done in e economics or uh, education. Uh, it's called STAR. It's about the effect of class size, so how many uh, children are in, in a class on their education, on um, test scores, um, to, be, to be exact. So uh, the experiment was done in the 80s in Tennessee, where elementary schools got a lot of money, I think about $20 million, to create these special small classes. Uh, which and they should alloc they should have allocated randomly students and teachers to these small classes. And in in the table in the first column here, you can see the treatment effect. Um, and actually, it's it's a regression. So what what we do we regress the test scores on a variable which is one for treatment for a small class but it's the same as if we just compared uh, treatment, the means for treatment and co control groups. And it's about five, which means essentially if your daughter um, is transferred from normal class of about 25 students to a small class with 15 students, she's likely to move up about five percentile points up in the distribution of test score. So it's quite sizable. The fact is, it's uh, it's not negligible. Um, okay, so that's you know the usual way uh, how to do an experiment, but this was a complex ex experiment. So some people might say, okay, but you should also take a school heterogeneity into account. So in the second column, we add um, we allow for different intercepts for each school in the regression, and we get essentially the same. Um, effect size, five, but now we get much smaller standard error. So we get much more precision. And the reason is now we have much more 
ability to predict test scores because we account for the school heterogeneity by by many many different uh, intercepts for different schools. So the internal model is more precise. The R squared of the regression is higher, and also the treatment effect is more um, crisply estimated. We can also add um, characteristics of students, like here, and also of teachers, like in the in the final column. And we can still slightly decrease uh, the standard error, so we can increase the precision. Um, so these are the, the in parentheses we have we have standard errors. So the point of this example is that if if one plays around with uh, variables in a regression context, it is not impossible to influence precision and sometimes even in a systematic way. So you can, if you try long enough, you can get more and more precision in your results. And now then it's not super clear which one of these um, results you should actually uh, report. I think one can find good arguments for any of them, even though precision is much smaller in, in the final specification than in the, in, in the first one. Now, this is an experiment. If you move to observational research, you have much, yeah. much more uh, degrees of freedom, actually, than uh, just uh, these sensible, sensible controls. You can play much, much more around. Uh, so that's the basic intuition for why there could be some spurious precision if you play around with control variables in regression. But there is also another reason. Um, why we could have um, spurious precision. Um, and for this, for this example, we don't need any regression. We just we use the same data, the same experiment from Tennessee on class size. And we just compare the means of the treatment and control groups. So the first specification from the previous slide. In the original paper, which we replicate, Krieger and 99, he computes the uh, standard errors by taking into account that test scores within one class can be related, which is quite restrictive in a way that you will get uh, small precision. You will get plenty of variance, large standard error, but it's um, it's conservative in a way. So you you are on the safe side. But some other people might claim. Okay, maybe it's enough. This is too restrictive. Maybe it's enough to take into account that uh, test scores may be related within schools, not, not exactly within classes. When you do this school clustering, you, you get much smaller standard error, about 1.4 compared to 2.2 in the original case. Now, some other um, people may, may even say, this was a randomized experiment, so it's okay to just compare the means for treatment and control and just compute the, the precision standard error in a standard way. So no adjustment at all. And if you do just plain vanilla uh, variance computation, you get 0 0.8 for standard error, which is about one third of the original, the original um, one reported in the paper. So this is the second uh, way to get uh, more precision that originally the data give you if you play around with the definition of how uh, variance is computed in the data. Uh, by the way, a small digression, we also have a meta-analysis of the class size effect here. Uh, it's available at meta-analysis.cz slash class. And we find a very small effect uh, after correction for publication bias and p-hacking. So, and so the, 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 the effect size of five, which Krieger found is really an outlier in, in the sense of the entire literature. Okay, so what are the consequences for meta-analysis if we have some spurious precision? And I will mostly talk about the funnel plots and techniques based on the funnel plots because that's what we commonly use in economics. But in the paper, we also have selection models. Um, but just for simplicity here, I will stay with funnel plots. Now, um, uh, techniques based on the funnel plot, if they do allow for some p-hacking at all, 
it can only be p hacking on effect size, so on on estimate size, not on precision. So precision is given, and the assumption is well, if people are so inclined, perhaps they can you know try different specifications to get a larger point estimate uh, to get these um, these whole circles denote by the way estimates which are not statistically significant. If you try hard enough you can get um, inflation in the effect size, which compensates for uh, the imprecision in your estimation, and you can get statistical significance. Now, this type of p-hacking is completely fine for funnel plots, because in the funnel plot, you focus on the top, on the most precise estimates, um, the number of which is, differs across techniques. But essentially, the most precise ones are the ones which matter the most for, for the result. Uh, for example, the, the PEACE technique by uh, Tom, Tom Stanley and Chris de Culiagos um, uses a quadratic regression here uh, for the observations, and then it estimates the intercept here at the top of the funnel. So you can see it would work quite well with this type of p-hacking. So this is quite standard. What we focus on in this paper is the opposite. Uh, P-hacking on precision, which is basically what I tried to explain in this example, in the second table um, on, on the class experiment from Tennessee, in which, as you can see, the point estimates, the effect sizes were the same, but we could decrease and decrease and decrease uh, the standard error in parentheses. And by different computations of um, of variance, and if if this type of p hacking is uh, is happening at least a little bit, then we have troubles in funnel plots because the top of the funnel, which means the most precise estimates, is no longer an unbiased estimator of the of the true mean effect, which is about one in in this simple example but we will have a downward bias. So that all the funnels uh, and actually all estimators which use precision as a weight, all estimators which use inverse variance weights will give a biased result here. Now, let's see how it works in a simple simulation. So we have a population of uh, researchers who um, with some probability p hack. The probability is not really important, but in our simulation, one half of people never p hack. The other half will p hack if they get uh, insignificant results. And they can p hack either on the effect size, which is the usual case in the literature, or they can p hack on precision, which is the main innovation here, the main focus of this paper. And the proportion of p hacking, the, the different types of p-hacking among p-hackers, among those people who do p-hack, is on the horizontal axis here. On the vertical axis, we have bias in the estimator. Um, and because the underlying effect on average is one, then if there is a bias of 0 0.2, it means 20% bias. Um, we just show three estimators here. In the paper, we have many more, but just for simplicity. If one, use, if one is very naive, and if we use uh, just the simple mean as an estimator in meta-analysis, so no weights, just the simple average, uh, we get a result which is biased, of course, because just to go back a little bit, we had this case of p-hacking. Uh, if all the people who do p-hack, p-hack on effect size, we have inflation in the mean, unadjusted simple naive mean, so that's what we get here in the blue line. While the, the piece, pet piece, the funnel um, correction technique is works perfectly. It is able to just, again, to go back, it's able to perfectly predict the top of the funnel, which predicts um, the true mean effect um, beyond NLP hacking. But we get into serious troubles with all these techniques actually all techniques which use inverse variance weights, 
when we introduce at least a small percentage of people who p-hack on precision. So here, when 25% of p-hackers p-hack on precision, we already have all these funnel-based techniques and even just simple fixed effect estimator, which is just weighted average, um, the average weighted by inverse variance, we get a bias which is actually larger than the bias of the uh, naive simple mean. So no no real meta-analysis, just do the uh, do 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 mean of all the reported results. No correction at all. So in this case, and that's just the proportion of among p hackers. The proportion among the entire uh, population of researchers is much smaller because many people do not p hack at all. Many people would p hack but get significant estimates, so do not p hack. So it's enough to have. A few percent of people who engage in p-hacking on precision, who produce previous precision, to turn these common correction techniques actually worse than the original disease, which is p-hacking or publication bias. So that should give us some uh, motivation to explore this problem further. You know, maybe in practice it's not so super prevalent, but even a small, um, small. Um, Incidents can be uh, can be important. Small uh, contamination creates troubles for standard meta analysis. So, what's our solution? Uh, and this is the the largest or the uh, the slide with the most text in the presentation. So, I will spend a few minutes on it. Um, what we do, we adjust. We can adjust using our technique. Uh, we can adjust all these common estimators. We focus on a piece because it's easy. That's the main reason. It also works quite well in many simulations, but here it's just for simplicity. So there's the equation number one. It's nothing new, it's P's, which means quadratic equation, which accounts for p or publication bias. And E0 is the estimate of the top of the funnel. So there's the important quantity here that we try to estimate with solid confidence in travels. Um, so that's what we want. Now, one important qualifier, we use the version of P's without inverse variance weights. Of course, the original version by, by uh, Tom and Chris uses inverse variance weights. In this case, it doesn't really matter if we use the weights, which are adjusted um, in the way which I will describe, or if we just completely drop the weights. Because it doesn't really matter for the bias, for coverage ratios, for MSCs, and so on. We prefer not to use it because it's simpler, but uh, you know, we have no strong opinion on it. So people can people can safely use this adjustment also for technique for techniques which still uh, use weights. Okay, so equation number one is just piece without weights. What is new is equation number two, in which we compute what we will use instead of variance in the piece equation. And what we do, we regress the reported variance, variance reported in primary studies I, on sample sizes in primary studies I. Because of course, by definition of variance, there should be a dependence, which may be imperfect depending on the context of the study. And we take the fitted values from this regression and we plug these fitted values into the original equation number one, in this case, piece, but you can use whatever correction technique you, you want using this way. So that's the main idea. Now you will probably ask, well, and I should say, why is it called instrumental variable estimator? In econometrics, this is called instrumental variable estimation. Uh, this system of equations, when you have troubles with one part of a variation in this variable, which we say may be spurious, part of it. So we try to use only the part of the variation in variance which is really predicted by something which is given, which can be p-hacked, at least not easily, and that's sample size. So in pi i, 
we should have all of these spurious precision things which are not used because we really use just the fitted values, not the PIs, not the disturbances in, in the estimator when we use uh, the fitted values in equation number one. So that's the motivation. So MAVE, meta-analysis, instrumental variable estimator. Um, you will probably ask why not simply to replace a variance with sample size, which has been done sometimes in meta -analysis. Well, there are many, well, at least three, uh, I think, advantages of the instrumental approach. First, in principle, uh, variance is not just influenced by sample size. It can be also affected by the way people cluster, as we showed in this in this Tennessee experiment example, and by other, you know, uh, characteristics of the context in which the estimation was done. So by methodology, so you could add more instruments in equation number two. It's it's not difficult. Second, for the same reason as I just described, um, sample size is not a perfect predictor of variance. So you have some noise here. Um, also, alpha one is probably not one all the time, and so on. Um, so if you just replace in one variance with inverse sample size, you get rid of spurious precision, but your estimate of E0 will you will have spurious precision in your meta-analysis. You will have spuriously precise estimate of E0 because it will not take into account the imprecision in the original equation um, here. So you need correct um, standard errors also in your meta-analysis, good coverage rate, which means you should use these instrumental techniques, which take into account this uncertainty, this noise in, 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 in this equation number two as well, before you plug in other things, the stuff in equation number one, or whatever estimator you want to use instead of piece. And finally, well, replacement is just a special case of instrumenting, because if you use zero instead of alpha zero, and one instead of alpha one, well, and also zero instead of pi i's, you, your, the instrumental regression reduces the replacement. So the instrumental solution also nests the simple replacement solution inside. Okay, so what happens in the previous simulation when we um, do this instrumental MAVE uh, thing and we have new estimator, in this case, it's a version of piece instrumented, the green line here. And you can see it's, it looks really good. It corrects for bias in all different scenarios. So no matter how many people pick on precision vis-a-vis -vis, uh, effect size, we, all, we are always um, able to correct fully for the, the resulting bias, which results for, for, from the PH. Now, this is quite encouraging, uh, even though it's a very simple um, simulation, it's, it's not realistic at all. But again, uh, if I go back, at least, at least some, um, um, you know, some realistic background can be provided by, by thinking about how people compute uh, variance in regressions or maybe even in experiments that we can really play around with the way how clustering works, how uh, the, the standard error is computed. Okay, so in the simple simulation, MAVE works perfectly, not just for P's, but for any, any funnel-based uh, technique. But in reality, uh, it is possible, and probably it's plausible, that both types of p-hacking will interact. So in the previous simple simulation, we only allowed people to, if they, if they were inclined uh, to p-hack, uh, select from these two modes. So either p-hack on effect size or p-hack on precision. But in fact, they can do both at the same time, which is shown in the funnel plot here. So they could combine these two types of p-hacking to, to get results which are at the same time spuriously large and also spuriously precise, potentially, of course, not, not always, but, but there is this, this potential. 
and the uh, real life intuition for for this more complicated simulation is the first example which i showed before again the star experiment from tennessee where when you play around with controls again this is an experiment when you have observational data there is much more many more degrees of freedom to play around with control variables in regression but you change generally both precision and also the the estimate estimate of the effect size which you get so this is the intuition for for the more uh, complicated uh, simulation okay so again what you what you see sometimes you have larger estimates which are at the same time more precise which means all of the estimators even the simple naive mean that also estimates based on or estimators based on the funnel plot, estimators based on selection models will be biased upwards. There is going to be a result which is too large, larger than one in, in this case. And let's see how the simulation actually works. So here we are, uh, okay, on the horizontal axis now, because we have these two types of p-hacking which do interact. They are not separated as they were in the original in the simple simulation. Uh, it is a bit more complicated. Now we have on the horizontal axis, a total potential for p-hacking, which in the simulation is given by the correlation between the treatment variable and control variables, which are important and can change the treatment effect, the result. So this is most relevant for observation research when we always need regressions in economics, we always need good controls or we need some quasi experiments, natural experiments, but it's, it's always difficult to find exogenous variation. So we mostly do uh, regressions with many controls. And then when we play around, um, the, the potential for playing around is given by this correlation between treatment and control variables. In, in, in regression. So that's here. In the paper, we also show when you increase this total potential for p hacking in the way I just described, you also get relatively more weight of spurious precision um, compared to compared to p hacking on effect size. So you have more, as you move to the right, you have more p hacking on precision than p hacking on the effect size. And in the figure we have, well, we still have the simple mean, which is the black uh, dashed line here. But we also have many other estimators, uh, also selection models um, and, uh, and different flavors of models based on the fun plots. But essentially, even if you add some more techniques like the hedges model and so on, they, they are all quite, they have similar performance. Um, Especially, there is always a point in which all of these estimators get worse than the simple average. It's not as bad as it was in the previous simulation. Um, so in most cases, they work better than the simple mean. But always there is a case when you have extreme p-hacking when actually the estimators, which are meant to correct for publication bias and also maybe for p-hacking, especially the, the funnel-based techniques, they, they are worse than the, the original disease. Uh, good. So how does MAVE works in this more complex, more um, complicated situation? So MAVE, again, we just here uh, show the simple average, simple mean, uh, piece, which is the, uh, the sorry, the, the red line here and MAVE version of piece. Again, you could use, you can compute a MAVE version of any of these estimators on the previous, but we just stay with piece for simplicity. And you can see MAVE is still good in the sense that it improves the performance of piece in when there is plenty of spurious precision. But it's not perfect at all. You still get a bias which is about 30%, well, it's not 130%, but it's still a sizable bias in the end. So, so the correction uh, helps quite a lot, 
uh, even also in uh, qualitative terms, but it's not perfect. There is still uh, quite a lot of room to improve. Okay, so what are we are working on now? Uh, we are re revising the paper for one of the nature uh, journals, and we were asked to add many more uh, complexities to simulations, so different twists, different um, scenarios. So we are kind of um, you know, combating that requirement now. Uh, and we would also like to add uh, some, um, um, some empirical verification. So to see, you know, does really uh, the MAVE correction matter in practice? Uh, how does Fourier's precision differ across fields? For example, is it more of a problem in, in economics, observational research, uh, compared to, let's say, medical research or psychology, where you have many more experiments than we do? In economics and so so um, on, but probably this this point number two and three will be in a different paper because otherwise we will have a paper which has a hundred pages, which is quite common in economics, but uh, it's it's not easy on on the reader. So most likely in 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 the, in the second paper. Uh, finally, we have a very small meta research group in Prague, um, metaanalysis.cz, where we do mostly applied uh, meta-analyses in economics, but we also have a few papers which have consequences for other fields, especially psychology, but also uh, maybe more broadly. So we have a meta-analysis of discount rates, uh, of risk aversion, and incentives and performance, for example. So that's all for me, and uh, please ask me.